Hi, this is Josh Marshall. This is the Josh Marshall podcast. You're going to you're going to uh notice right off the bat I don't sound like I usually sound on this podcast. It's the same great radio voice, right? All that kind of stuff. But we're actually um we this is part of the the transition, the kind of the general transition of TPM kind of coming back into its office space. I won't get into all the details, but basically we, we found out uh, the morning of recording that we didn't have the the AV setup good to go in 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 our New York office, um, and so we, we decided it was better than to skip this episode. We're just going to do this one with with basically subpar sound quality on my side. You're gonna you're gonna hear Kate in a minute, and she'll be top notch as usual. But uh, my sound quality is a little low, so apologies in advance. Um, uh, uh, we kind of went back and forth. Uh, Kate thought it's 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 really better not to skip an episode, and I think she's right. So um, if you can if you can bear with us to just this episode, we'll be back good to go. Uh, when we're back with you next week. In any case, so with that uh, apology out of the way, uh, hopefully you can hear, I think you can probably hear me fine. It's just, it is interesting how um, we get used to different sound qualities in different contexts, right? So like right now I'm using my AirPods and we use those, you know, we're talking on the phone, uh, TPM had a really great virtual event yesterday, and uh, since you know our guests, we had Ben Jealous, uh, we had a you know we had a we had a great a group of people. But usually they're using kind of what I'm using now, and it sounds fine. And yet, obviously with 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 the podcast, you're used to that kind of studio quality sound quality, and when you don't hear it, it's kind of jarring, right? It's different. It's sort of like for 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 some for a lot of podcasts, we're used to something like radio quality, you know, radio production quality sound. So anyway, enough about that. We had the recall yesterday, um, and by the time by the time it actually came to election day, I think it was a strong consensus that 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 uh, Gavin Newsom was going to pull through. Uh, I think it was always, despite what some people were saying, I think anybody who really paid close attention knew that was always the likely outcome. But there was certainly a point, I don't know, what, six weeks ago, something like that, maybe eight weeks ago, where it really seemed kind of touch and go, or at least, uh, you know, and, and, and the Democrats in the state rightly, and this was a, this was a, the right strategy. It was a smart strategy. Where you get burned in elections like that is everybody's thinking, hey, California, you know, we haven't had a Republican governor in forever, uh, haven't had a Republican senator in like twice forever. Well, you know, it's not going to be a problem. You need to tell people, hey, yeah, I got to turn out. Yes, Democratic state when, 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 when people actually vote. Um, but as you've probably seen, he didn't just win. He like destroyed uh, the recall. I mean, it's not quite a two to one margin. Um, and, and as is often the case in California, you know, I, I, I think the way it works there, it, you know, there's probably a lot of provisional ballots. Uh, your, your ballot, your mail ballot can be counted as long as it's probably, I think probably postmarked on election day. So we're not going to know the final results for probably a couple of weeks or something like that. Um, and maybe his margin will come down to something more like 60, 40, which is which is kind of where California statewide elections usually, you know, end up something in something in that in that category. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. But, you know, the, the 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 thing in that case is. There's nothing for Democrats to get too excited about that they won a statewide election in California. Um, right. I mean, that's, that's, just, that's kind of obvious. Uh, and they were they ended up being helped by the fact that they had. Um, so they were helped out a little by this guy, Larry Elder, who, in effect, became the challenger, even though that's not how the recall system works. It's really a terrible system. A lot of us, I think, including myself, think there, there shouldn't be recall. Right. I mean, if 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 the governor goes insane 
and does something crazy, you, there's always a system to impeach a governor at the state level. You've got something for an emergency. It probably shouldn't be recalled at all. But they've got this really bad system in California where it's two-tiered. So there's one question, should the governor be recalled? And if that gets a majority, he's done. And even if the so and the new governor could be the per, the rando who got 10 percent. Right. And suddenly he's governor. It's just a ridiculous system. He has to run against himself and then he's not allowed to run against the person who might actually be governing. Yet. In any case, that's one of the ways that Gray Davis uh, ended up getting recalled uh, almost 20 years ago now. Although in that case, I think at least that that uh, Schwarzenegger may have actually have gotten a majority in the second part of the you know, second part of the recall. In any case, it, it's set up that way. And, but in fact, uh, uh, Elder, Larry Elder became the, the face of the recall. And that was pretty good for Democrats because, you know, a lot of people, this is the first time they've he heard of Larry Elder, uh, he's been around forever. And he's the kind of guy who, you know, if he hadn't been the recall candidate, you know, maybe the next time there was an opening at Fox, he would have gotten a show. He's just that kind of, he's been around forever in that world. Uh, a lot of, you know, kind of bullshit right-wing positions that you get if you're like a talk radio guy or something like that. I mean, it's probably like Gary Elder's like, uh, uh, you know, lucky for him that he ran for the recall. Otherwise, he would end up as another like, you know, middle-aged uh, Republican shock jock, you know, dying in the hospital of COVID. You know, anyway, I, I, I jest, not terribly funnily, but I jest. And I think he actually said that he has been vaccinated. But that's who Larry Elder is, is that kind of person in the in the Republican ecosystem. Um, but that said, the real question why this is actually is kind of pretty encouraging news for Democrats is that, again, he won by a massive margin. And what that tells us is that even in this kind of weird middle zone where an incumbent party is often kind of lagging, kind of in trouble, having turnout problems, having enthusiasm problems. Um, COVID is a big thing and, and it's hard to for a governor to navigate COVID policy without pissing off a lot of people just because it's tough, right? Um, and in this case, they really showed that they could turn out their voters, a lot of their voters. Um, and I think they were able to do that, you know, to some extent, look, as we said, it's a democratic state, but they were able to do that because they were able to say, look, this Larry Elder guy's just, he's just Trump. And he really is just Trump, right? And it is true that the recall, that's basically the Trump people trying to come in and, and, and sort of slip through coming into office using this weird recall, um, you know, using this weird recall mechanism. Um, and the other thing is, it really seems like, at least from the exit polls, the big, the big issue people had, not surprisingly, COVID. COVID is the issue. It's the first issue, second issue, third issue. And what uh, Newsom, I mean, there's the record you know, going going back a year and a half now, there's this really embarrassing French laundry scandal. And and for those of you who don't know what it is, basically it's kind of, a, it's, it's sort of the height of the first wave when like every other governor, he's out there, wear a mask, do this, stop the spread, blah, 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 blah. But basically, you know, kind of w went to a birthday party with a friend in a restaurant with no mask. You know, and and I think at least they'd all been tested or whatever, but you know, that's not good for a governor. You can't, you can't be doing that. Um, but in recent weeks, I think he has, Newsom has, has been kind of where Biden is now in that, in that mode of kind of like, we've been at this for a year and a half. You got to fucking get vaccinated and everybody's going to, you know, kids are going to wear masks, kind of like, you know, ramping up the pressure. And that seems to have worked and really people liked that. Um, so overall, it's again, it's a democratic state, but if you if you're old enough to remember 1994, and certainly almost everybody's old enough to remember 2010, these couple years in, 
time can really be bad for Democrats. So this is kind of an encouraging sign. Um, in any case, let me remind you that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. This is sort of one of those, uh, you know, an artifact of the pandemic. I'm sitting here looking at copy that would have been the copy that I had in like February, March, 2020, right? So I'm going to have to kind of wing it a little uh, to, to, it's you know, um, it's, it's, it's pre-COVID, nothing there about, oh, you're, lo you know, you're locked at home and locked down or stuff like that. In any case, uh, it's the same old good Grady's. Uh, remember, they're our uh, sponsor. And if you want to get 25% off your first order, you can go to Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. You can order it at Amazon. Uh, you can pick it up at a lot of grocery stores and stuff like that. It's great stuff. Um, I drink it uh, probably to an unhealthy degree. And uh, our whole team does. So Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee, that is our sponsor. So Kate, um, turning it over to the first the first class sound production quality. What's up? <laughs> yeah, so uh, as you said in your monologue, now $276 million later, Gavin Newsom continues to be the governor of California and now gets to head into his real election, which is in a few short months because he's up in 2022. So not at all a wasteful process. <laughs> Is it um, really? Wait, have, so what is what is two hundred seventy six million? Is that for both of his elections so far? Or is that all? What is that? That's what the whatever they call it. I think their finance department said that's how much the recall cost. Oh, the re so not the campaign, but like mm. the recall putting on a re. Yeah, it's it's, yep. it's such a cost the state a ridiculous amount of money. It's such a stupid process. It's really and and uh, you know the other thing too is is that it's pretty easy to do one. You just, it's just, you know, there's always going to be a lot of reverberation. And it's, I think it's 12% of who all voted in the last statewide the, election is all that's the, needed. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah. So it's not nothing. It's not like you just need to kind of get like a couple hundred thousand signatures, but like, it's not like there are no Republicans. I think there are actually more Republicans in California than any other state. It's a big, it's a big state. Right, there's like 50 million huge. people there or something. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, and then, 30, 40 million people, 40 million people. And now Larry Elder uh, is hinting that he might run again in 2022, <laughs> which the political calculus there, it's like, OK, you couldn't do it on an off year where Democrats are less likely to vote. But you think you've got a real fighting chance when they'll turn out in greater numbers. <laughs> yeah, I get it's funny. I saw a headline this morning that basically said. You know, now it's it's you know Larry Elder's California Republican Party that you know he lost, but he's like the you know he owns that party. Is this Chris like, Elizas? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe I have no idea. But I mean, but I, but it's more the kind of like okay, you know, I I, I own the Palm Pilot I used twenty <laughs> years ago. It's it's stored in a box somewhere. <laughs> like good luck with that, right? It's not much of a thing. And I, I do kind of wonder, um, you know, there's always going to be someone running for running for governor of California. It's a big state, blah, 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 blah. But I mean, uh, yeah. uh, you know, are you going to get people really pumped? I, I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> this really shows. I mean, Newsom, for, you know, by whatever means. He's pretty popular, whether it's just he's not Trump or whatever, man. But, I mean, he, he, he demolished this. So, I don't know. I mean, yeah, he can run. I'm sure he can yeah. if he wants. Who, what real politician wants to run? Right? right. I, mean, he, I mean, for him, he's yeah. like, he's, like uh, he's uh, you know, it's, it's a way to kind of juice up his, like, uh, you know, supplements business for the, for the, for the talk radio show yeah. after the thing. <laughs> But for someone who, because I think, what is it they had? I, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in California, but I'm pretty, you know, it's been a long time. And But I think it was a former, uh, maybe former mayor of San Diego, this guy Falconer, who um, I, I should oh, really yeah, that's right. have, have some idea what I'm talking about here. Yes, former former mayor of, of San Diego. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Pete Wilson, former mayor of San Diego, very successful. I mean, 
politically successful former governor of, 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 of California. Um, my sense is, is that, you know, he's a real politician, not someone I would support, but kind of like, you know, someone who's actually run things could have done an okay job. He got, he was nowhere. No one voted for him, basically. I mean, the, the California Republican Party is, is like basically become, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's an, it's a govern it's a political party version of like Newsmax. Right, they're yep. playing in a different in different territory. Anyway, I've been stomping all over your your uh, your part of the show, Kate. No, I, not at all. That's like that's kind of what I've been thinking as well because it's not like having a Republican governor in a blue state or a state where Democrats have massive registration advantage is unheard of. You know, it's we have lots of examples of that, and a lot of them have kind of been able to walk a tightrope you know, where they don't alienate the Trumpy base, but they keep themselves palatable enough. So in a state that has an obvious Democratic advantage, they don't get slaughtered election after election. Um, yeah. You know, like it, the Larry you know, Hogan's of the world types. Yeah, well, there's there's Hogan and the guy up in, in Massachusetts. Charlie Baker. Uh, Baker. Yeah, Charlie yep. Baker. And it's it's funny because, I mean, on the one hand, you don't get stuff like, you know, there's no like, oh, kind of really conservative Democrat running like Alabama, right? That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder kind of, you know, what the difference is here is that, you know, Massachusetts has been a very Democratic state for a long, long time. And Maryland has been a very Democratic state for a long, long time. Um, I mean, in, in fact, in Massachusetts, going back like almost 30 years it's, it's, it's they all they have constantly have republican governors and i i think but with that what come what what it comes down to there is sort of massachusetts republicans know they're you know it's like being the democratic party in like mississippi or something like that they're all even worse in a way so you can you certainly have Trumpy people. You got a lot of Trumpy people in Boston, frankly. Uh, you certainly have a lot out in Western Massachusetts, and those people are willing to kind of take anybody with an R after their name, mm -hmm. just just to kind of you know own the libs for such as it is in in Massachusetts. And that there's this kind of tradition of Republicans in that state who implicitly are saying, "Hey, I'm not going to be like the National Republicans." It'll just be a little more conservative. It'll be fine. And and mm -hmm. the and the states, you know, people are kind of okay with that. I wonder if the issue is in California that not too long ago, California was not just not a blue state; it was a really red state right. in statewide in statewide stuff. And and I wonder at some level whether and it's also just a freaking big state. Like I've lived my, I've lived my whole adult life on the East Coast. And people from these coasts, you're thinking of, you know, state is like 100 miles across, right? <laughs> but it, all of the Northeast fits in California. <laughs> and you've got these kind of, you know, the South, generally speaking, more conservative than the North. It's really more kind of, even though Californians don't think in those terms, it's really the, you know, it's the coasts and the sort of the hinterlands. It's, you know, the conservatives are all kind of out, out, um, uh, out. Uh, further east past the coastal cities, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if part of it is, is that California Republicans haven't quite accepted reality yet, right? Um, okay, haven't haven't quite. Uh, wh whereas in Maryland and and you know Massachusetts, those have been Democratic states forever. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's right, and I. I've seen it like a lot of kind of, you know, post-election day punditry that's been about, you know, Democrats shouldn't take too much of a, uh, shouldn't take too much satisfaction from this. I mean, it's in the category of the whatever Democrats do is, is bad for them kind yeah. of stuff. But a specific, you know, kind of vein of it has been Newsom was really helped out by his opposition, the fact that Larry Elder was kind of like goofy and peddling his supplements and very Trumpy and didn't appeal to a state that has, you know, 
a huge democratic registration advantage, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, point taken, but I also, it's funny to me that that translates into, so this can't be at all read as like a democratic advantage going forward, because I would read that data point as, okay, so the Trump wing of the Republican Party has a huge amount of control over what kind of candidates get traction and get put forward, and that model gets rejected in all but extremely red states. I mean, how is that a bad thing for Democrats? Yeah, exactly. It's it's no accident. I mean, Larry, Larry Elder didn't pull some trick right. that made him the guy. <laughs> it, it, and as we were saying, this guy, Kevin Falconer, I don't know a lot about him, but you can't write San Diego tends to be it, it's certainly more conservative than the political culture there's more conservative than Los Angeles and San Francisco but you can't be a crazy person and 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 running that they've got kind of a tradition of Republican mayors there but that guy went nowhere and and mm-hmm. to your, so so to your point that that is not some uh, that's not some freak accident we're gonna see that playing out. Uh, well, that is gonna, you know, we, we had, Kate and I were involved in this great, Kate was the host. It was, it was this great event, virtual event we had yesterday. Um, and Kate's going to tell you uh, a little more about it. Um, but one of the big things we're talking about is redistricting, which we know is not, is, is bad, right? Is, is really not going to go great for, for, for Democrats. But even in those things, even in, even in a redistricted district, you know, that's kind of designed for Republicans to maximize their, um, uh, you know, their, their, their electoral power in the House, you still have to run people who are not crazy. And if you do run crazy people, um, you can end up losing. You know, that's, uh, that's, um, and, and, and that can happen. Right. And so, again, as as Kate said, that isn't some kind of freak accident that's built into the current political reality. Uh, our producer, Jackie, is telling me that uh, the, the event is, is up. The video of the event is, is up online. So if you if so as we talk about it over the course of this episode, if you're interested, you can you can check it out. I'm sure there's yeah. a link kind of prominent on the site somewhere. Yeah. So I guess to kind of wrap up our redistricting talk, you know, it was this kind of, as you mentioned, like big freak out, you know, where it gets to a point where everyone is, you know, all the headlines almost uniformly say big fears over California. Uh, You know, Democrats aren't enthused. They're not going to turn out. And whether or not that had a hand in stirring people to turn out, you know, they did. They turned out pretty big, especially for an off year. And kind of despite the reflexive, kind of media attempt to find a way to make that bad for Democrats. It seems pretty good for Democrats. It seems like a lot of people turned out uh, on this, you know, a super weird year, a weird recall. People might not even be paying that much attention to politics. Um, I think to some degree also the Newsom campaign took the challenge very seriously, especially in this last stretch, raised, I think, like $80 million to kind of send out a lot of ads. I mean, Biden and Harris both came in person to California to stump with him. Um, and I mean, kind of escaped to the worst case scenario that was haunting my mind about this was that, you know, Democrats wouldn't turn out. Newsom's gone. And then if Diane fine, Feinstein fine, fine, were yeah. to die, it would be there goes the uh, there goes the Democrats effective majority. So all yeah, of that I mean, was avoided. It's definitely one of these things, as we said, it's a democratic state. Any result can only be so good for the Democrats. But of all the possible results, this is as good as you could imagine. Right. And good in a way that actually does lend some encouragement uh, to what we know of, you know, of the next 12 months of the political calendar, over, you know, uh, going into 2022. I mean, I don't think we've used this exact analogy or this way of thinking about this result. We, we, Kate and I have largely talked in terms of turnout. But another way to look at this is that one of the downsides people have been talking about for Democrats is they don't have Trump to say Trump is terrifying. You got to vote because of Trump. 
And what Newsom showed is that actually you can. You can do that. And he did do that. And it was incredibly successful. Um, and, you know, that was always kind of going to be at least a big part of, of you know, Democratic messaging in, in 2022. But I guarantee you, you know, House races, Senate races across the country, they're going to be looking at how, you know, what he did. Because, look, it is it is Trump on the ballot. Trump is the Republican Party. Republican Party is Trump. They're trying to get back in. They're trying to hamstring Joe Biden. So it's a, it's a good it's a good result for Democrats. Tells them something pretty positive. Yeah, and I think also a data point where Newsom made a lot of, especially the home stretch of the campaign about COVID restrictions and about voting for the Republican is it's a life or death choice, and that seemed to play really well, which is also something I think even if you can't extrapolate everything from the super democratic state, I mean, it, it, it is a good data point that people are receptive to the argument that, you know, I care about COVID. I'm trying to end the pandemic. My Republican opponent is trying to prolong it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because um, we have seen, as I mentioned a little, a few minutes ago, we're now Biden and Newsom in the last month or so have both been in this mode of sort of like we're out of patience mm -hmm. you know kind of bring down the hammer we're not asking anymore you got to do it blah 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 and there's a fair amount of uh, polls out showing that that is popular people are out of patience and as we've discussed on the site in in various contexts as much as we don't have nearly enough people vaccinated among voters among people over 18 it's like 65% of the country is vaccinated. So it is like a big majority. And uh, more people are vaccinated, the older you go in the, in the age scale and more people vote. So we know that, but there's always this idea, well, okay, sure, but Republicans have geographical electoral advantages right. in our political system and they're just hardcore and they always show up. Um, and what it kind of reminds me of a bit is something that was really kind of a formative experience for me as a political observer and as a journalist is, is, is the 1998 midterm election. Um, and that was the one where basically Republicans, I mean, <laughs> the president had had an affair with like a 21-year-old intern, right? <laughs> And whether he had perjured himself, I don't, I've never convinced he really perjured himself. He certainly wasn't honest about it, right? And it wasn't great to have the affair with the intern in his, in his office. So, so Democrats carried that into the election, and Republicans made that the entire election that Clinton needed to be impeached. But there was the reason his Clinton's numbers stayed so high is people did not like what he had done, but they also could see that. Republicans have been trying to do this forever, basically, to, to create some big scandal. And they knew it was a scandal, but it was kind of done. Like, okay, yes, he did that. We're not, we're not impeaching him. And if you looked at the polls in 1998, this was, I probably remember it as such a great formative experience because I got it right. I was so, I was so, <laughs> I was so pumped. Um, but basically, if you looked at the polls going into that election, they showed pretty clearly what the outcome actually ended up being, which is that de the Democrats had not a great election, but they picked up a few seats rather than. But again, the predictions were they're going to lose like 40 seats or 50 seats. And the explanation was when, when you said, well, but wait a second, polls don't show that. And Clinton is, is bizarrely popular. Well, but there, it's, it's the intensity. They believe, they're true believers, they always vote, blah, 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 blah. Um, not necessarily. And this is, again, showing that, that uh, these restrictions are popular because people are done with this. You, everybody, of course, we're done with this. Um, and uh, I think this is the minority position. And that, again, sort of, I, I do think that's something, you know, the idea that the sort of the really intense, angry minority of people who are 
you know, they're refusing to be vaccinated. They need sort of mass freedom for kids in school who aren't vaccinated, all this kind of nonsense. It's not popular. And this, this shows that. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to another headline today, which is that President Biden is going to meet with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema separately today to discuss their opposition to the reconciliation bill with a top line of $3.5 trillion over 10 years. So Manchin, the more affectionate of the media of the two, um, has kind of been going on a print and TV circuit, you know, seemingly crafted to cause Democrats agita where he's talking about 3.5 is way too high. He wants it to be one or 1.5. The reasons kind of vary interview to interview. Sometimes it's like, quote, runaway inflation. Sometimes it's, we don't know what's going to happen next with a COVID pandemic. Sometimes it's just kind of the reflexive spending squeamishness thing. Um, and then cinema has basically only made her position known through statements and spokespeople, which is basically boiled down to her saying, I'm not okay with 3.5 and not, not too much else, <laughs> not a lot of rationale. I think she just is taking her cue from Manchin that this is something they're going to be difficult about. So now Biden's going to kind of sit down with them one-on-one, which is funny because that's such a refrain. We were we heard a lot last night at the event, but we've been hearing a lot in general from voting rights advocates who are imploring the president to kind of bring the power of the presidency to these two senators and try to sway them to get rid of the filibuster. And, you know, he is taking action now, maybe just not on the, the issue that people have been calling for him to. Yeah, it's a funny thing because, again, I really – you should – you should uh, check out this this event we did. It was really good. You can see the video on the site. And one of the things that came up and one of the things that I actually got into a back and forth with, with a couple of the other panelists about is, you know, this was about voting, voting rights. These are people, these are, uh, um, you know, campaign organizers, voting rights activists. So what they're seeing now is, you know, uh, for the People Act that seems to be dead, right? And they're pissed understandably Mm -hmm. and their refrain is basically why is the president not bringing down the hammer why isn't he using the bully pulpit you know that thing um and my my pessimistic thought about that is that i think slash fear that they know Manchin is not going to do it. And if you know he is not going to do it, it doesn't make sense for the president to kind of go out on that limb if the if the branch is going to break. It doesn't help the president to kind of say, you know, you're against it, but I demand it. I'm putting the presidency on the line. You have to do it. And then if he doesn't do it, that's like terrible for the president. And my fear is, is that that's the reality. Um, and I kind of... I sort of wonder. Um, I, I sort of wonder with this thing, right? Kind of. You don't have to put out an announcement that you're having this meeting. You can just have the meeting, right? You can also do it as a phone call. You can. You don't. You don't have to kind of put this out there, right? Mm-hmm. And so I kind of. I'm uncertain about what the plan is because, okay, you have the meeting. And what if Joe Manchin comes out after that meeting and says, yep, I told president one, one trillion, that's it. Okay. That didn't work. Like, like you don't generally, it's it's sort of like a lawyer. You don't ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Right. Because now he's like, Oh, I kind of called him in to the white house you know, to meet, to meet with me, I hope, you know, is, 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 did they they have a plan with Joe Manchin? Kind of like, okay, you'll come in and then we'll say we've had a meeting of the minds. And then, I mean, I hope it's not just kind of like they made a big announcement and he's coming in. They don't know what's going to happen. That's, that's not necessarily good. Um, So I've been, you know, I, 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 I've, I have been a, 
I don't like ever being a pessimist. I, 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 I am only a pessimist to the extent that, you know, cause, cause people in the voting rights community is like, what is Joe Biden doing? Why isn't he, why isn't he going all in on this? Does he not really care about voting rights? It's obviously a very big issue for, for the African American community who really made him president, you know, made him nominee and then made him president. So what's, you know, why is he not, having their back and again i fear this is why because they know that these guys aren't movable and i kind of i sort of have a similar concern on the on the you know fiscal policy stuff on the infrastructure stuff but again it's sort of like don't ask a question you don't know the answer to yeah like, i mean i kind of want to worry about that on the infrastructure front i just i think that the difference there is you know, just with the filibuster fight and the voting rights fight by extension, only one side's got any leverage, and that's Manchin. On infrastructure, if he s- says, no, we're only doing a $1 trillion package, I insist, you know, Bernie Sanders and I guess by extension, really, the House progressives are going to be like, okay, cool, well, we're not doing the bipartisan infrastructure bill then. Because the whole way yeah. this is crafted is to give both camps leverage. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't well, know. I all... just... Go ahead. I was just going to say, I wonder, you know, and he's been very, Manchin's been very blase about this when, when brought it on TV, the prospect of, well, they say they're just going to tank the bipartisan bill. And Manchin's like, well, fine, let them, whatever, you know, but well, I do wonder if that yeah. gives Biden some kind of ground to come from that's more than just, you know, please don't sink my presidency. Right. I, I again, I kind of, <laughs> I don't like being such a downer, but I, what I, what I worry about is, is that he is kind of fine with this. Yeah, me too. You know, the big, the big infrastructure thing, like, yeah, it's, it's, he was into it to the extent of making the bipartisan deal, but is he really going to be busted up if there's no spending on roads and bridges? I don't think so. So, you know, again, that, that's sort of, um, I don't know if he's that blase about it, but I mean, let's be honest. The progressives want this real, real bad. They want all of it really bad. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, they don't like the bipartisan bill, but they do want roads and bridges spending, right? And they don't like, they don't like lots of the particulars about it, but it is on balance more spending that they want. And I fear that, you know, is is Joe Manchin's mission in life a bunch of infrastructure spending? I don't know if it is. You know, I, I, I do wonder, I'll tell you this. I increasingly think that Kirsten Cinema cannot be reelected again in, in Arizona. Um I think that I don't even know if Joe Manchin is going to is going to run again in 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 2024. He's in his mid 70s. Any election is going to be tough, even for him. Mm-hmm. It's not a cakewalk in in West Virginia. So who knows if he's going to run again? And frankly, I um, does Kirsten Cinema want to run again? I'm not honestly. I'm not totally sure, but I don't think outside of West Virginia. I don't think it is any longer possible to run for Senate as a Democrat without saying in advance that you will either oppose, that you either will get rid of the filibuster or that you will reform it in some dramatic way. I just think there's no way. I think there is, there, there is no Democratic electorate in this country that you're going to say, yes, you know, send me to the Senate. We're going to do big things. They say, ah, but, you know, filibuster, I just feel like it's tradition and it kind of, I mean, in a Democratic primary, you know, you're, you're having the debate among Democrats to get the nomination, and you say that, man, you're, no one is going to vote for you. No mm-hmm. Democrat is going to vote for you. I think it is clear-cut enough that I think basically anybody who ran, who, um, ran against Kirsten Sinema, even in Arizona, I don't think she – let's put it this way. I'm not certain 
that she would lose a primary in Arizona. But if you have to fight to hold on to your nomination, you're going to lose the in in the general election. So again, I just don't think there's any way she can she can win re-election unless she does some major repositioning. And I don't. I'm not sure she realizes that. You know, it's big for me to say. I'm not from Arizona. She, she's from Arizona. She got elected to the Senate. So it's not like, you know, maybe I'm flattering myself to think um, I know more about this than she does. But again, the logic, I think the logic I just said is is indisputable. There's just no way Democrats, I mean, it, it has become the filibuster has, has, has just become the thing for any kind of, you know, engaged Democrats. So I do, I do wonder, I do hope that, is that going to come into play for her? Does she want to run again? Because again, it's not even, it's not even great for Democrats. It's not great to lose that seat. And I think there's a good chance they will lose that seat. Mm -hmm. Because again, you need a, you need a united party. Um, so maybe that can come into play. I don't think, I mean, man, she worked really hard to become senator. I, no one walks away from a Senate seat like that. It kinda, it's a little hard for me to imagine that she doesn't, hard for me to imagine that she either doesn't grasp those political dynamics um, or that she doesn't care. Yeah, you know? I don't know. I mean... To that degree, Manchin's thing has never super made sense to me either. Like, I get it. He's from a super Republican state, and he needs to have kind of crossover Republican appeal. But I just can't imagine that what small coterie of Democrats there are in West Virginia, who he also, you know, he needs to get elected. I mean, obviously, it's a much more Republican state, but he needs whatever percent of Democrats there are there to vote for him. And I just... I know that both of them think that they're showing themselves to be some kind of reasonable centrist, a attractive to both sides of the aisle, but I just can't imagine that what they're doing reads as anything but stymieing the president's entire agenda, who the Democrats who elected them also voted for Joe Biden and wanted, yeah. thought that they gifted him, you know, a Democratic Congress. And all they've really done is kind of stymie that at every turn and not really based on any kind of ideological you know thing it's, it's clearly not a well we have a personal opposition to xyz because i mean the rationale changes all the time and they oppose things that don't really have much uniformity except that oh here's a good chance for us to kind of tweak our nose at the democratic leadership and i don't know and maybe i'm wrong maybe there is a market for that of democrats who like that but i just especially with cinema just because her state so doesn't call for her to act like that. But for both of them, I just, I have to imagine that they are risking really, really in and unmovably angering Democrats who otherwise would support them and who supported them before this. Well, yeah, I think that there, I think that there is a market for, there is a kind of Democratic voter that that basically says i'm a democrat i definitely don't want trump to be in i want there to be abortion rights i want there to be a progressive tax code i want to hold on to obamacare but i'm okay if there's some people making sure that 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 what is that what is to a great extent you know bernie and aoc's agenda someone kind of holding that back Give me Biden. I don't want Trump. Give me Biden. Let him do, you know, let him do half the infrastructure thing. Let's not go too far. I think there is a there is a a market for that. There's no question there's a market for that. Um it's not a big market, but you need everybody, right? And I think the key is there's a couple of things. Joe Manchin has been around politics in West Virginia for a long time. To a great extent, Democrats have that seat because Joe Manchin has sort of gifted his, his politics, his kind of 
political shtick in West Virginia to the Democrats, right? Um, and so I think it can work there, but Kirsten Cinema doesn't have any of that, right? She doesn't have any of that. There's no history with Kirsten Cinema. She's a new thing. And frankly, I think to a great extent, all of her nonsense, this um, in, in, in under Joe Biden is because she was literally, she was a spokesperson for the Green Party when Ralph Nader ran for president in 2000. And early in the aughts, she was, you know, the, the 20 years ago equivalent of like AOC politics and stuff like that. You know, very anti-Iraq war, but when, when not everybody, you know, all that. So I think to an extent, all of this is trying to live that down. You know, it's not just, oh, I've kind of matured and I'm now a senator. You thought I was that, but I'm not. I mean, I'm actually like, I'm, pr I'm practically a Republican. And I think she thinks that she kind of... I, that is my best theory of this. She thinks she has to live that down. Now, are there are there um, Democrats of the type that I just described in Arizona? Absolutely, absolutely, there are. There's no question to me that there are. The problem is, is that those maybe make up ten percent of the people you need to get elected as a Democrat in Arizona, and you need both, but she's just, I, I, you know, and again, that 10% doesn't matter for much in a primary. So I think that, I think the political dynamics of this are different for both of them. Um, and I think it's possible that Manchin, you know, he's just got his own kind of thing in the, in that state, but, um, you know, what, what you mentioned before about the fluidity of their rationales, that's really the tell. You know, one day it's not too much spending, next day it's inflation, the next day it's like work requirements. You know, this is again, this is for cinema, this is about living down her nonsense from 20 years ago, which is really a bit rich because that's not our problem, right? <laughs> it's not our problem. You were acting like a total goofball in, in 2002 or 2004, or you were working with Ralph Nader and helped get us the George Bush presidency in 2000, you know, work it out with your therapist, right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is not, this is not on us, but here we are. Yep. So. All right. We're getting a bit long. So let's just talk redistricting briefly. So like we've talked about, we had this event last night. Um, it was great. You should watch the video on the, the TPM website. But kind of one of the big conclusions is we had Kyle Kondik on who's at uh, University of Virginia Center for Politics. And he and his colleagues just did this really intensive region by region deep dive into what redistricting will probably look like. Um, and, you know, as probably everyone by this point knows, not great for Democrats and the kind of area where Republicans are going to be able to squeeze out anywhere from six to 16 seats from redistricting alone is Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas. And specifically in Texas and Georgia, the Republicans are going to be very incentivized to try to lock in their political power because those states are seeing huge demographic change. And uh, obviously, as we saw in Georgia in 2020, that is already having a big effect. Those states are already becoming less Republican. So the Republicans are going to try to entrench their power there with some pretty extreme gerrymanders and, you know, lock it down for the next decade, kind of no matter what happens uh, to the state's composition. And in some of those states, you know, Kyle goes into detail about all this, but you know, what is it? the Texas Supreme Court is not very likely to beat back a partisan gerrymander. So that part of it is kind of dire because this, the big story of the last decade was that even though Republicans had a lot of successful partisan gerrymanders, the court ended up unwinding some of those, specifically in states like Pennsylvania and Virginia. And that really allow Democrats to kind of compete and ultimately take over those states. This time, 
it's in a similar situation. Republicans have the advantage from the beginning. They control more state legislatures. They control more line drawing. Um, and, you know, from there, it's kind of a question mark. How will st- how will these courts behave? Um, there's to some degree, it's really hard to gerrymander a place that's growing really fast with any durability. So that might come into question, uh, especially in Texas and Georgia, no matter their kind of worst efforts. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's we're going to start getting maps this month, next month. There, it's going to be an uphill battle for Democrats because it doesn't seem like any kind of anti-partisan gerrymandering legislation is going to pass anytime soon, thanks to the aforementioned mansion and cinema. So there'll probably be a lot of court battles over it, um, you know. And in the meantime, Democrats have to figure out a way to amp up the base to vote, even in the face of you know, the voter suppressing laws and now the partisan maps crafted to dilute the power of their votes. The, yeah. And the one thing, I mean, you know, realistically, it's not, it is, it is not a good situation. There's just no getting around that. And it is, it is the first midterm of, of Biden's term in office. Uh, incumbent parties seldom do well in that situation. So, you know, it is sort of sacked against the Democrats. The point that I tried to make yesterday is it's it's really important to see that redistricting, you know, I think probably maybe the consensus is that, you know, Republicans can pick up maybe 10 seats just on redistricting, and they only need five. But, but it is important to keep in mind that that is in the face of the median election. You know, if everything is just kind of normal, you know, sort of the baseline. Uh, Biden's really unpopular in a year. I mean, it could easily be 30 or 40 seats they lose. And it is also true that even with redistricting, if Biden's popular, if the country is doing well in a year, Democrats can hold on to the House. Anybody who, even the people who are telling you all the bad news about the redistricting will tell you absolutely. It, it's, it's not that it locks anything in, it just tilts the board. And if you can tilt, you know, if, if, if the state of the country tilts it more in the opposite direction, you can have a good result. It's just that, again, midterm elections are, are bad for the incumbent party. Pretty much, you know, usually, not always, usually. Um, and it's important to consider what the exceptions are. The exceptions are 1998, that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, when you had, when, when the election was basically about this scandal that Republicans were, were overdoing and the country was sick of. And the other recent one was 2002 when 9-11 and the impending Iraq war basically hovered over the election. And what that tells you is that the times that that pattern does not play out is when you have big history going on, big things are happening. And we've got one of those big things, COVID, absolutely. So it's not impossible that, that, that you know, uh, Democrats can hold on to the House even with all this stuff happening. I'm not saying that's likely. I'm just saying it's possible. And and to keep your minds open, because like every other election, the real story will be the state of the country in a year and a couple months. And that's why I do think, um, going back to where we started this episode, the California result is significant because it suggests that Democrats can turn out their voters to a great extent, to a significant extent by invoking Trump, and that aggressive COVID mitigation policies are supported by a majority of the public. So that's, that's, that's worth keeping in mind. And I guarantee you, the people who are in charge of running Democratic campaigns next year are keeping it in mind. Yeah. And I think just one last thing that Kyle said that I think is a good point is, you know, it's not all about 2022 either. There is the factor of 
in 2024, when Biden's up for re-election and Democrats tend to turn out more in presidential election years, we could be having a situation where the question of 2022 is not so much, will Republicans take the House, as it is, if they're definitely going to, you know, how much do they take it by? Because if they land in the neighborhood, if he said a total of like 225, 230 seats, I mean, that's something that Democrats could just take back in two years with more turnout. The you know, the nightmare case, the worst case scenario is that Republicans have an absolute huge wave election and they claw back a ton of seats to the point where it's just not realistic for Democrats to try to challenge that uh, in the presidential year. So, I mean, there is also kind of a, a gradient of for Democrats how bad things could be. Right, right, right. Right. So let's take a couple questions. These were actually left over from the event last night. Um, so if you have questions, do send do send them in. We need we need them every single week. Uh, this one is from an anonymous asker who asks about the California recall. He says if the results are claimed to be stolen by Republicans, would a would Democrats passing a voting re- bill by themselves then set up Manchin and Cinema to agree to limited reform for voting rights? Basically, in the face of another big effort to claim that an election is stolen, would that be enough to sway Manchin and Cinema? And I would say, you know, this question, uh, of course, happened before the recall happened. Elder has made it somewhat clear that I think he's not going to go with the the election is stolen route, at least based on his um comments right after the election yeah i mean it's it's when 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 the other guy when the other team wins by 66 percent i mean come on right i mean i mean the whole i basically i don't think these two things are are conjoined at all i don't you know i i think uh that republican you know, election rigging thing is really existing now within a Republican, you know, media ecosystem. Um, they kind of made themselves look even sillier than they already look by in the week before the election, start saying, oh, it's been rigged. It turns out, you know, kind of like, dude, you know, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think Kate's point about Elder himself, the fact that he isn't even up for it kind of tells you um, h- how much uh, traction that has. And um, so I don't think that's really going to go much of anywhere outside of, you know, maybe Newsmax. And so I, I just don't think it has any connection to the For the People Act or Banshin and Sam. It's just, it's just not connected. Yeah. I mean, I also just think that as we've been talking about, I don't think Mansion and Cinema are really ideological. I think it's all about their brand. I think it's about the idea of being a centrist, kind of divorced from any policy stance. So even if Republicans did launch this, you know, scary, full-fledged effort to steal back the recall election, I just don't think it would change their calculus because Cinema, in particular already professes to desperately want voting safeguards. I mean, Manchin's been spending the past few weeks crafting some compromise bill he's okay with behind closed doors, and that hasn't seemed to move them one iota on getting rid of the filibuster. So, I mean, I think if they were ideological people, then something like that would probably alarm them and sway them, but I don't think basically anything they do is really rooted in any kind of conviction. Yep. Agreed. Okay. And this question from Paul It seems unlikely that we'll get voting rights bill passed at this time, but will the strong negative positions taken on those bills by the Republicans hurt them in, say, 2022? Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think so, because I don't I don't think there's a lot of perception that they're against it. It just isn't happening. There hasn't even I mean, in theory, there's been a vote, but it's not like. There weren't big headlines saying, you know, 50 Republicans vote against voting rights. It, 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 it's something that um, most people don't even know is happening. So I, 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 I don't think, I think the answer is no. And to a great extent, since the uh, Republican media ecosystem is sort of hermetically sealed, um, in that world, what we're talking about is just a bill to, you know, allow 
what they call illegal, you know, illegal mm -hmm. aliens to vote and count their votes twice. Right. It's so divorced from kind of what it actually is. But no, I don't think it's it's going to. It's certainly not going to hurt them with their voters. Um, I do think it is possible that the general atmosphere of stolen election audits will could turn off people as a general matter, as just part of the general mm -hmm. Republicans are crazy kind of thing. But that's totally divorced, I think, from anything about how and whether anybody supports this bill. Because again, no one even knows about the bill, unfortunately. Exactly. And I think you can tell that by the fact that Republicans have barely even bothered to kind of coalesce behind an opposition. You know, you hear some of what you're saying about this helps felons and illegal aliens vote. Um, you hear a little bit of this is a federal takeover of elections, which are done by the states. But it just it hasn't really even been a full scale thing, because I think Republicans are so pleased and confident that Manchin and Cinema are going to stymie pretty much everything else that Democrats try to do that. You know, why why make it an issue? Why make it a debate? Yeah. Why take a side at all? I think that's a hundred percent it. They they are confident that Mansion and and Cinema are going to kill it. So why even why even do, do the limited list of of coming up with reasons to oppose it? As far as they're concerned, it's not even no one's even asked them, right? So it's kind right. of it's it's not good. So yeah. And on that. All right. <laughs> yeah. So so we're 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 trying to keep it somewhat optimistic. Um, and, and look, I, I actually think, um, you know, we don't know how history unfolds. Uh, this is clearly, um, you know, th this has been a very challenging period for, for Democrats. And, and I, I basically mean the sort of the second half of the summer until now. Um, but there is a lot of moving parts right now. Um, so, uh, you know, keep, keep, keep watching. I think there's... Um, we're we're now at that kind of you know kind of what what seems like a very dark moment that I don't think is the reality of the situation. I'm not saying it is like it is it is you know morning in America and every or morning for the Democrats and everything's perfect. But I I I think that we're in a in an unrealistic low at the moment. So uh, with that, remember uh, Josh Marshall podcast brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. We'll be back next week with uh, professional quality audio again. <laughs> And uh, and that's it. Talk to you next week. All right. Talk to you next week.